I'm immersed in the world of chassis on a daily basis, and I find them fascinating, and I hope to sort of share some of that passion with you today, or at least talk a little bit about the importance of, of uh, the chassis in intermodal freight, um, and by extension, urban freight, um, and the supply chain in general. Um, this is a, a, a variation of a talk I gave at another Metrans seminar that we hosted on my campus just two weeks ago. Um, and if it's any indication of the interest within the industry in this topic, we had about 20 people, so a similar number as you all, but they were all industry folks. So the, there was some student interest, but it was really about, about industry. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, today about um, research that I've done um, that's been funded by the Metrans Transportation Center, the, the UTC. Um, my co-authors are um, the director of research at CITT, Tyler Reeb, and one of our uh, Masters of Econ students, Annette Kunitsa. And as the issues of chassis continues to evolve in the industry, there's continual need to update our work. And I now have one of my Masters in Supply Chain Management students, um, Ahmed Mohammed, working with me on it as well. Um, this, is a, this is some research that surrounds a um, an industry-driven response to challenges with equipment management in the supply chain. It's a, it's a response called the pool of pools. And I've already heard some talk about what does that mean, right? So if nothing else, by the time you leave today, our objective is, to, is for you to have an understanding of what that, the pool of pools means and, and how it, is a, and how is, it is a response to some challenges facing the industry. Okay? Um, I want to sort of hit upon a couple of points today. I want to provide some background on the changes in equipment management, chassis in particular, and what's the motivation for this research? Why am I so interested in this? Um, along the way, we'll talk a little bit about traditional chassis management practices, and that's a story about why the United States is different than everywhere else in the world, right? Not surprisingly. Uh, once again, here's another example. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the catalysts for change and emerging models for chassis management that are supply chain solutions. I want to I use a little bit of research that I did with a colleague here in engineering, um, Handam Le Griffin, as a bridge to the research that um, uh, I've recently undertaken on chassis. And that's to sort of give you a sense of why we want to build upon the work that's already been done. Um, and then talk a little bit about um, uh, after our research, where we want to take it next. So this is what we're talking about. This is the intermodal chassis. Right? This, is the p this is the workhorse of the supply chain. Uh, it's the piece of equipment that makes containerization and global trade in many ways possible. It's, uh, it's the equipment on which you move the ocean container um, once, it, once uh, the cargo is discharged at a port. Um, so it can be transferred both regionally to local distributions and warehouses, to uh, rail ramps, right, to intermodal rail yards, um, or for transfer onto uh, over-the-road longer-haul trucking to serve markets around the country. Um, this is equipment that's used both on the docks at the ports for movements back and forth between segments of the docks. It's used to move the container between terminals. And it's, as I said, used to move the, the same container from ports into um, distribution centers and warehousing. Right? So it's, it's a, it plays a critical role in making an efficient and effective supply chain possible. Right? Um, why is it important to look at this piece of equipment and to make sure that it's used effectively um, as, a, uh, as a way to make sure that the supply chain moves effectively? Well, first and foremost, it's worth looking at what, whether our business practice and the history of chassis management in the US makes any difference. Right? In this country, right, historically, the ocean carrier, right, those companies that move the, the containers across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, they have owned the chassis and they've owned the containers. Right? Everywhere else in the world, either the trucker, the truck driver, owns the chassis. Or the, the major uh, retailer, right? what we would call the BCO, the beneficial cargo owner, um, owns the chassis and provides it to the, the truck driver. Why the difference in the US? Right? 
You want to hazard a guess what might be, might be different here? I'll give you a hint. It's tied to the origins of containerization. Where did contain containerization start first? Intermodal containerization. Right? Started here in the US. Right? In the mid-1950s, right, uh, it was a trucker named Malcolm McLean who um, had the idea of, of moving cargo between Houston and New York more efficiently by putting goods in containers that then could be put on a truck chassis once they got to the port of destination. And the first big player in this was the Danish ocean carrier Maersk, right? And Maersk, which by the way is still um, tops in, in the business, um, saw a potential to serve the interior of the US market, right? And they figured that if we made the container and the chassis available, we could actually control the market not only to the port, but beyond to the final market, to the last mile. So when the business started here, Maersk purchased a lot of chassis. And because they were the biggest, everybody else followed. Right? They said that's different from the rest of the world, where once the, once the containerization was underway, the truck drivers invested in, uh, in the equipment themselves. We're talking about managing a lot of equipment. There, are 640, there were 640,000 chassis in North America in operations at the peak about five years ago. And we'll talk, that number's decreased a little bit, and we'll talk about why. It's a huge question for us in Southern California, because of that 640,000, a fifth of them were in operation here in our region. 70% right? of those were owned by ocean carriers. The remainder were owned by large companies like Walmart or Target. They might invest in their own chassis to move their goods. Um, by, a thir by third party operators who made chassis available to smaller, opera uh, smaller um, importers or exporters who needed the equipment. Right? What challenged this model posed to the supply chain is that because the ocean carrier owned the equipment and not the truck driver, what ended up happening is that a truck driver would pick up um, at the port, a container and a chassis, make a delivery maybe to the Inland Empire to drop it off, but because he or she didn't control the equipment, had to bring it back to the terminal where it was stored for the ocean carrier. Right? What type of impact do you think that has on a regional supply chain? If you're moving equipment back and forth to the port instead of sort of maybe dropping off an import container in Rialto and then picking up an export container to go back. Does it, yes? Well, it increases the number of trips that could be rendered unnecessary if you didn't have that sort of ownership problem. Right. It, it, it creates a lot of unnecessary trips, right? So you've got additional VMTs, so there's an environmental impact. If you're the truck driver and you're paid by the trip and not by the hour, right? You've got a lot of inefficient back and movements back and forth. And because at the ports of LA and Long Beach, we have all of these different terminals operated by different companies, what ends up happening, what ended up happening is you had a terminal, you had a truck driver return to a terminal and sometimes he or she was bringing back a chassis with a container on it, but that chassis didn't belong to that terminal operator. We call that a foreign chassis. And so the truck driver would then have to reposition that chassis to one of the 13 terminals at the ports of LA and Long Beach where it belonged. More inefficiencies in the system. And again, about five years ago, we were in a position where 30% of all terminal container transactions were associated with a foreign chassis, which meant there was going to be an additional move or transaction for that piece of equipment. Right? And the other th inefficiency that was built into the system is you had valuable real estate down at the ports right, dedicated to this, chassis storage. 10% of the land uh, five years ago, which is when our sort of story begins, was dedicated to this. Right? So this is a supply chain problem. So that's one reason to study, to study it. Okay? There have also been some recent 
incentives for change because we've had broader global trends in the supply chain that demand more efficiencies. We have larger vessels coming in to call at our ports that are discharging more containers at peak periods, which is creating peak demands for equipment and for labor. So you need to use the chassis efficiently if you're going to service the larger vessels. Right? And in addition, you've got major ocean carriers sharing capacity in these larger vessels. Right? Um, so you've got con containers being discharged at terminals that then need to be moved back and forth to other terminals at the ports. Okay? There's another interest that I have, and that's from my, my sort of interest in policy issues. And for me, the, um, one of the things we're going to be talking about is the fact that um, this challenge with equipment and chassis becomes a problem for the ports themselves and the terminals. And it's one way in which the ports have decided to get involved in the broader supply chain is to address this problem. And so from a policy perspective, a regulatory perspective, this is an interesting question about boundary spanning activities. Right? Ports looking at something that's not their traditional scope of work. Right? And we observe that ports are shifting from, their, from sort of a landlord, where they provide infrastructure to individual terminal operators, as one to where they're a manager sort of of the port regional interface. And one of the places where you see them interjecting themselves or injecting themselves is in the um, is in the local trucking industry, right? And those are the people that move the chassis. And uh, it's not, not surprising that we've seen a lot of what I would call dredge flashpoints uh, recently where this is in evidence. By the way, does everyone know what I'm talking about when I use the term dredge? Here's an, an, an amazingly interesting fact to, to share with your friends at your next party. Um, when I talk about dredge, I'm talking about what is essentially local trucking like short haul trucking, to and from the ports to distribution centers or warehouses. And it's a term we use that's different than long haul, long, long haul over the road trucking. Right? It's different in a number of different ways. One, it tends to be, uh, the, it's, it, um, it's made up of smaller independent owner operators. It's largely a non-unionized workforce in comparison to the, the over the road long haul trucking. Um, which tends to be a more a unionized, employee-based workforce. Here's the interesting point. Anyone know what the origin of the term dray is? The term dray? A dray is actually a three-sided cart. And in the days before containerization, the people who were in the drayage business were the ones who went down to the port with their carts and picked up goods that were loaded off the ship by hand. But we still refer to those companies as drayage companies. But this is a really critical part of the industry and in some ways a vulnerable one. And we've seen challenges that have impacted the ability of the supply chain to operate. Right? So in LA Long Beach, we've had terminals struggling with, with long turn times to move containers in and out of the, the marine terminals. We've had this chassis dislocations, which I'll talk about. Um, we've had congestion on the yard, so in, congestion inside and outside of the gate. Um, we've had labor issues. So the, the challenges that we have in Southern California are, are not unique to our region. They're just a little bit more acute here. But it's another reason to be studying what we're studying. Right? The, other, the other reason we want to study this right, is because there are significant um, reasons for the industry to address the chassis, this, this chassis business model and look at new ones. Um, the first is that. Um, We've had a lot of inefficient use of our land, as I mentioned, because we've been storing chassis. And we've had the luxury of space, which means that our, our terminal operators have not always had to be really efficient. This is just a comparison of the size of the Port of Singapore um, and the amount of containers it moves on an annual basis relative to the size of LA and Long Beach combined and the size and the amount of containers that we might move on an annual basis. The difference is we store a lot of chassis. We don't stack as high because we have the luxury of land. Okay? But that has changed. Why? Okay? Um, for a couple of reasons. Right? And I'll start with that second major bullet. Um, in 2005, economy is great. We have uh, spikes in cargo moves. It creates congestion because of the increasing volume of cargo that's moved. 
that congestion creates a demand for more efficient space so you can move more containers through the ports. Okay? Um, that's followed by the recession, right? the global recession, which means that uh, ocean carriers have all of this, these chassis and containers for which there's not as much of a demand now. So they're in the business of storing idle capital, which is not making them any money. So you start seeing an interest in looking for a new business model. Then a, 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 from a policy perspective, in June 2010, there's major federal legislation um, that establishes new um, chassis fitness standards across the country. Right? This is under the jurisdiction of the Federal Maritime or the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And this is a significant step because what it does is it creates a, sort of a, becomes a level playing field for, chass, for chassis. And it shares the responsibility for the, ocean, for the ocean carrier or the owner of the equipment as well as the truck driver who has it in his or her possession when they're on the road. Prior to this point, companies would brand themselves with the quality of their equipment. If you now, if everybody's meeting the same federal standards, you don't have that incentive, right, uh, because the chassis are presumably more or less interchangeable, right? So what do companies look like? What do want, how do they want to respond? Well, they, do, they could do it in a couple of ways, right? They could um, figure out that we could establish a chassis usage charge, which gives more flexibility to the truck driver when the, the chassis is in their possession, and that eliminates the storage from the terminal, right? The ocean carriers could get out of the business altogether and say, we're just not going to own the equipment. We're going to hand it off. We're going to sell it to truck drivers. We're going to sell it to independent equipment providers, IEPs, which will manage the equipment for the supply chain. Or we can create chassis pools where we can sort of share our chassis with the other ocean carriers, right? Means we, 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 and we can provide to the pools only the number that's really needed. We don't have to store an excess amount on our terminals, right? Or some combination of all of these. And this is where the industry started moving, right? The first step was you saw individual ocean carriers companies adopting their own business model. So Maersk, that company that was first in the business of, of chassis management and ownership, decided to transfer ownership of its chassis to a subsidiary, right? And motor carriers rented the chassis on a daily basis. So this was a first step in eliminating that repositioning that was really inefficient. Truck driver rents the chassis, can do with it what he or she wants until they return it. And they pay a, an amount per day. When this, this started, uh, it was $15, uh, $15 a day per chassis, right? Um, another uh, company, OCL, provided their own chassis or rented them uh, via a third party, right? So this is the growth of the independent op, uh, IEPs, independent equipment providers. Um, some companies provided, continued to provide chassis for major customers. SDD is, is store door delivery. So for major companies, the ocean carriers would guarantee the delivery of cargo directly to the store door. And that meant folding in the chassis as well. Right? And then at least one company, Evergreen, said, we don't want to change our business model. We want to provide, continue to provide them to our customers. So in the interim, you saw sort of this splintering effect where the chassis uh, were provided in a number of different ways to a number of different companies. For the chassis pools, there were a couple of different options. Right? The traditional model right, was where the ocean carrier owned the equipment, the ocean carrier managed the equipment, and they had a master agreement between the marine terminal operator, which is where the equipment was stored. With the, with the incentive to, to pool the chassis to eliminate the congestion on the docks, you had sort of a couple of different models that were developed. You had a terminal pool, which meant that all of the ocean carriers that serviced one particular marine terminal, as I said, there's 13 between the ports of LA and Long Beach, agreed, all right, we'll pool our chassis for, anybody who, who, for any who, anybody who uses our ocean carrier services on that terminal. But the chassis are going to stay at the terminal. Right? So there was a little bit of interchangeability between company, but they were still stored in the same location. And if you had to move the chassis off-site or to another terminal, you still had to do that repositioning. There was another option that was a regional pool, right? Where the ocean carrier still maintained ownership 
but there were some con contributions by a third party. Right? These were stored in some cases in an off-site location, but still some cases on-site at the terminal, but with a higher level of interchangeability between the terminals. There's what we call a gray chassis pool. And this is a pool of chassis that are fully operated by a chassis leasing company. And there are three principal ones in operation in Southern California. Right? So you had an arrangement as a truck driver, uh, and you would pull from this third party um, company. Problem was, your, the relationship between the, the, the chassis equipment provider and the ocean carrier meant you still might be pulling chassis from one of three different pools. So another step toward intercha interchangeability, but not fully interoperable. And then it, the last model is where some truck, uh, truck com trucking company said, this is way too confusing. It's not working for me. I'm going to invest in my own equipment and bring it to the table, which is like the European model. Any idea why we just don't go there in the first place? If you're, if you're in the trucking business, and what I just told you about the drayage industry, what might be some of the obstacles to investing in lots of chassis to use for your moves? If you're a small company, it's expensive. So the initial investment, the capital investment, that's part of it. Another bigger, sort of more practical, issue. I heard it. Storage, Storage right? If you're, if, if you're operating in a business and you're an independent operator and you've got contracts with a number of different companies, right, where are you going to store the equipment? Right? It changes the business model for you entirely. So tremendous potential benefits to these chassis pools. right? You can conserve your assets. You can conserve land. You can sort of rationalize terminal operations in general. Um, you can improve safety because you're not having chassis stacked on top of each other. They're, they're, they should be what we call more roadable, roadworthy. Um, you can reduce congestion. You can reduce bare drays, which are those repositioning trips. And they facilitate what we call street turns, which means that if you're in possession of the equipment and you control what you do with it as a truck driver, you can drop off a container that you've picked up full of imports at the ports, and where you pick it up, you can pick up hopefully an export container and bring it back to wherever it needs to go at the ports without the, the repositioning. So what happened in LA Long Beach as this model was developing? Well, we had a couple of those contributed pools, right? The Grand Alliance, the West Coast, the Northwest Alliance. And these were not quite regional pools. These were partnerships among different companies that allowed interoperability at the terminals where these companies worked, at the ports. You also had those terminal pools, which is where most of the equipment is still kept on the terminal and shared among the companies that were operating at that particular terminal. This was, the by and large, the, the chassis pool model that was established in Southern California. Problem is, it doesn't get to um, the real challenge at hand of sort of, of making the supply chain more efficient. So a couple of slides about some of the first generation of work that I did with, um, with Dr. Griffin. We were interested in where the inefficiencies in these chassis movements were on the terminal. Right? Because of all this repositioning, we had a good sense that, that, that we knew that trips were coming back, truck drivers were coming back with bare drays to the terminal, uh, but then what did it look like once you got to the terminal? So we did some work where we observed chassis behavior at three different terminals. Um, we looked at sort of creating process flow scenarios for the way the, the equipment was used on the terminal. Um, we established a series of six nodes, which is where the chassis interacted with, um, on, with the terminal operations, which meant the in gate the outgate, the import and export yards where the containers were stored, and what's called a flip line. Okay? And this is sort of the, this is how you, you best understand the, um, the inefficiencies of a system where you have to reposition chassis. If you come back to a terminal with a foreign chassis, right, you have to go to a separate part of the terminal called the flip line, 
where the container is removed from the foreign chassis, put on a chassis that belongs at the terminal, and then the truck driver has to reposition that chassis to the terminal where it belongs. Right? So you have to dedicate land at your dock, at your terminal, for this type of operation because you have the old chassis business model. So um, I'm the policy person. Dr. Griffin was the engineering and the modeler. But we came up with diff eight different type of transaction types to see what would happen if you were able to use a pooled chassis or you were using a foreign chassis to see what impact it had on equipment movement on the terminal, right? So these were the combinations, right? Because one of the complexities of using a chassis is what type of transaction you have. And you can have any one of these combinations, right? You can, you can have a single transaction where you're just doing a drop off or a pick up and then leaving. You have what we call a dual transaction where you're, you're combining uh, a pickup of an import container with a drop off of an export container or vice versa. You might be returning um, a, a, a chassis to the, to the port. Um, you might be, and then we looked at a combination of whether these were foreign chassis or part of a chassis pool. And one of the things we did simply was to sort of look at the number of moves that were involved with the equipment on the terminal. And simply by calculating the additional movements that result in, result in using a foreign chassis, going to that flip line to get the container off the chassis, right? You get a significant increase in the number of total transactions, not only for the truck, but for the chassis, as well as what we call UTRs, which are utility trucks. Those are the equipment that move the containers back and forth between different segments of the yard that have to be engaged in the process if you're flipping a chassis, right? And so by doing this for all of these different scenarios, what do we find, right? That current chassis management practices without a cooperative pool have a negative impact on overall container terminal performance in terms of both eff effective capacity, system operation times, and air emissions. And not surprisingly, as the percentage of transactions that involve these foreign chassis increase, the total intra-terminal network movement time also increases. Right? That's kind of intuitive. Okay? Um, and then uh, Dr. Griffin ran these scenarios where we looked at if you, if you increase the percentage of chassis, um, the number of transactions over the course of, of a day, um, it, as you increase them from 0 to 10 to 20 percent, right, you get a change in, in total network movement time um, that is faster for terminals that have less capacity anyway, which suggests an inefficient use of land. Okay? What was interesting, though, is that there was no clear pattern that truck turn time increased as the percentage of transactions involving foreign chassis increased. And that wasn't intuitive to us. But what did make sense after looking at it a little bit further was that where you saw the impact was on the overall system runtime. Because of the amount of chassis and terminal equipment that was used in the move. So, the truck driver may have been able to get in and out and not increase their turn time, but the overall system time was impacted by the need for additional transactions on the terminal. Does that make some sense? Yes? OK. So I'm going to move on to, to get to, so we have some time for questions. So that brings us to the past two years. What, is the, what do these findings suggest to you? That even in a world where we have chassis pools, but they're pooled on the terminals, right? It doesn't give us a system-wide impact that's desirable. We still have, we don't have full interoperability. We still have a lot of repositioning. We're better than the old business model where the ocean carriers provided them, but we haven't entirely eliminated the need for um, movement of, of chassis between terminals and between operators. So I mentioned the fact that we, we started to see these, the evolution toward larger vessels and these new alliances between carriers that were discharging cargo at terminals um, that would then need to be repositioned to, um, to other terminals in the port complex. That created a, a context in which finally the ports, 
as a convener of supply chain operators, worked with the terminal operators, and those three gray chassis pool operators I mentioned, the, the people who, who provided the equipment as independent operators to say, okay, you have all of these independent pools, right? right? You Flexivan, which is a company, you have a pool, chassis pool. You uh, DCLI, which is the Merck sub subsidiary, you have a pool, right? Uh, track is the third company. You have a pool, right? What happens if all three of you contribute chassis to a pool of pools, right? You maintain some of your own uh, at your site, at your facilities, but you, we get to a higher level of interoperability by combining your independent pooled operations. And that's where we are. So this is sort of the evolution. Um, Maersk, which is the company that started this whole business in the US model, was the one that takes the lead again, right? They spin off their, uh, their chassis operator subsidiary so they no longer have control of it. Um, we have chassis sh shortages uh, causing long delays at the port of LA and Long Beach um, because of the um, uh, because of the larger vessels, because the alliances that are formed, and also because as the companies divested themselves of the chassis, there were fewer in the marketplace at a time when more demand is. When you're, when you're creating this peak demand with, search, with surges in cargo, you're creating demand for, for chassis at a time when companies were divesting themselves of it, right? So the three, the three companies pooled their operations and they established what we call the pool of pools, okay? So what did we, we've been observing the, this, these shared uh, equipment operations to understand in the short term whether in fact we have reached a point of full interoperability, right? Recognizing that this is an evolution, um, we want to do a couple of things. One is look at whether there were short-term impacts that we could use as a baseline for longer-term impacts a couple years down the road because this is still a relatively new phenomenon. We're in about 18 month period now since the pool of pools has been in operation. Um, we looked broad based at use of chassis across the country to understand the institutional impediments to chassis pools, why we, why we followed the, the model that we did here in Southern California. We looked at our unique Southern California experience with terminal and contributed alliance pools. And we monitored local press and trade publications. We attended local meetings. Um, we mapped the pool of pool truck movements similar to what we did with the intraterminal truck movements to see if we got a similar pattern of, um, of, efficiency versus, of efficient versus inefficient movements based upon the type of, uh, of arrangement that a truck driver was involved in. And we did 17 in-depth interviews as part of a stakeholder analysis with port operators, drayage companies, terminal operators, rail companies, and those independent chassis pool operators. Um, like we had those combinations of, of different type of transactions on the terminal, we came up with a series of scenarios for the way truckers were behaving under the pool of pools, right? And this is where we started to realize that it was a lot more complex arrangement than in fact people assumed it was going to be if the goal was fully interoperable equipment, right? The first scenario involved, well, what if chassis are available at the terminal? It turns out that in some cases, chassis are not available to a truck driver at the terminal because they're still being used for terminal operations, which means that in some cases, a truck driver has to go off-site to pull a chassis from one of those independent pool operators. That was an unintended consequence, right? Um, what if the right size chassis is not available, right? In some cases, you need chassis for heavier loads, okay? This problem uh, revealed itself in our interviews, okay? Um, what if the driver wants to use the same chassis all day at different terminal locations? Is there truly interoperability, right? Um, if in some cases, um, a chassis still needs to be flipped because maybe not, it's not foreign, but maybe it's not deemed to be roadworthy. So the flip lines are not entirely eliminated altogether. What does the process flow look like if you, in fact, as a truck driver, have purchased your own 
piece of equipment, right? And you have to have an additional trip at night to bring it to a storage facility, either your own or a place that you rent, right? Um, what if you own and use your chassis with a peer pass straight a yard? A peer pass is a program that exists at the ports to encourage um, shippers, the people who own the cargo, to shift the pickup of the cargo to the evening as a way to sort of smooth out truck traffic and eliminate congestion at the gates. Well, if you're, if you're a truck driver and you're contracted to pick up a load at night, that creates another set of series of process flows tied to the chassis equipment where you may have to pick it up in the evening and then take it to your place to store it during the day. Right? And you may have the option of leasing from a third party that's not a part of the pool of pools. Right? So these set of scenarios came about as our, a result of our interviews where we were expecting to sort of hear about, well, now we just, we just pick up a chassis at the port and it's fully interoperable, interchangeable, and we do with it what we want. We thought we would see more consistent, um, a, sort of a, a more consistent regional supply chain. In fact, it's proving to be a lot more complex than we had thought, right? So we went through the process of sort of replicating that, those process flow scenarios to look at the minimum and maximum total number of moves for each of these types of scenarios, right? So if a chassis is available on the terminal, right, there's still a, min a minimum number of moves on site that involve picking up your chassis, going through an in and out gate, and going through roadability inspection to make sure the chassis is roadworthy before you leave. But if your chassis is not roadworthy, right, and I'll talk about this in a second, if your chassis is not roadworthy, it may involve a stop to um, a repair, a maintenance and repair station, which adds an intra-terminal trip to your total supply chain. When you get to some of the more complex scenarios, right, if you go to a, a, a chassis, if you go to a terminal and you find out that your chassis is actually not available because there's a shortage of equipment, right, or there's a, there's a, a mismatch in the supply and the demand of the chassis on any given day based upon where the ships are calling, and you've got to pull a chassis off of a terminal uh, or from an off-terminal site, you may be looking at 15 numbers of moves um, as part of your supply chain, um, which involves picking up the, the, terminal, uh, the chassis off-site, uh, returning it, and there may be a combination that also involves a, a roadability inspection. So it gets a lot more complicated, um, and it also means that those, those challenges that you identify where you've got a, additional VMTs, particular environmental impacts, have not been eliminated altogether. In fact, in the short term now, we have, a, in some ways, a more complex supply chain um, that we need to understand further. Um, we asked these stakeholders why this was the case, right? And what they saw as the, as, as the potential challenges. And we wanted to know if, in fact, does this mean that this is a short-term solution or a longer-term solution. I just want to share with you as we close a couple of what of findings that we heard. By and large, across the board, ports, truck drivers, terminal operators, equipment providers, see this as a short-term solution, as a temporary solution to deal with the unique set of circumstances in Southern California. Where they see this going is a movement toward longer-term leases with individual pool operators um, maintaining their relationship with individual truck drivers or um, truck drivers actually purchasing their equipment. But because of the storage problem and because of the average size of the firm in this region relative to those over the road trucking companies, most people see this moving toward a long-term lease operation where the um, where uh, maintenance, repair, ownership would remain with the independent provider, but the truck driver would have a lot more flexibility to use the equipment and not have to return it to the same place on a regular basis, right? Um, the major challenge for self-reliance, right, um, is the land to store the chassis, right? Um, what some com trucking companies are doing in the short term is sort of a mixed method approach, right? They are um, they're purchasing a certain number of chassis to store on site and then pulling from a pool to supplement it 
during periods of peak demand. So they're finding a way to sort of be able to control their chassis where they can and where it makes sense for them to store it, but they like the idea of having access to a pooled operation. Whether they needed the pool of pools was a, another question. This is a big um, institutional challenge, which I know um, something that Dr. Giuliano and I have talked a lot about. Um, the, the efficiency of the chassis systems have um, been stuck in some of the contract negotiations between the dock workers, the longshore unions, um, and, uh, and the truck drivers. Right? Um, one of the concerns of the longshore workers, the ILWU, is that when the equipment is stored on site, and when it was the owned by the ocean carrier, they had clear jurisdictional responsibility and authority for maintenance and repair. Right? The ocean carriers were party to the contract with the dock workers. What happens if that equipment is stored on site, but is owned by one of those independent pool operators that happens to have an address off site? It's kind of a jurisdictional no man's land that will one day be resolved in the courts. In the meantime, um, there is at least anecdotal in, uh, evidence that the, the dock workers are exerting their authority and doing inspections at the out gate, even if the chassis is road, road, roadworthy, which is delaying um, the, the exit for the truck driver and increasing the overall time of the transaction. And this, at least in the short term, the truck drivers told us, acts as a disincentive for them to purchase their own equipment. Because no, they don't realize the benefit of having their own equipment, which would normally be easy in, easy out. Now they've made the investment, but they're still not getting the number of turns because they're being delayed on the out gate because of the inspection. Um, the, some have said this is resolving itself. After my last presentation, the general consensus of the industry folks in the room was that this remains a, an issue still. Um, the broader supply chain challenges uh, from the truckers uh, said that the vessel alliances, so these, this, these agreements where the, the truckers or the ocean carriers share space on the ocean voyage, um, has resulted in um, a lack of coordinated stowage planning. When you're an ocean carrier, and you're going to send cargo from China to the US, and it's your cargo on your vessel, you plan it in such a way so that you can discharge it at LA Long Beach in a way that's efficient. Right? The stuff that's on top that is unloaded first, then the vessel moves maybe to Oakland or Seattle or Vancouver. And, it, and then what's at the bottom is unloaded at the second port of call. When you've got a bunch of ocean carriers sharing space, a lot of that coordination goes out the window, which means you create a mess at the port when it comes time to discharge it. And because you're playing a game of Jenga with containers, you're creating an increased demand for chassis, which keeps the chassis on the docks and makes them less available for movement in the regional supply chain. Um, port authorities. Um, they have an interest in promoting competitiveness, which gives them a stake in chassis management. Um, they see the clear benefits from the intraterminal movements. They see the improvements of minimizing the use of the flip lines and the, and the repositioning and the transactions. But they also see the chassis management model as evolving. And they see the need for, um, for regional pools as opposed to terminal pools to make them more efficient. Where they're seeing their role is, and, and they're embracing it to a certain extent, is being a partner in making land available for off-site but near dock chassis storage for those truck, for the, to facilitate the moves with truck drivers. Um, rail stakeholders say that the pool of pools has had an impact on rail chassis availability. The inefficiencies that remain at the docks impact the, the availability of chassis at the rail yards. Um, and pool shortages at terminals have made it more difficult for rail carriers to move containers off rail facilities. Um, and what, this was an unexpected finding um, that we want to investigate further. Since the pool of pool implementation, rail operators say that they have difficulties in identifying chassis owners. Right. It used to be that you would be able to trace the chassis based on um, its ties to the ocean carrier. They're finding it much more difficult to track chassis that are decidedly inter interchangeable. And for them, if, they need to, if there's a, a chassis that, that should be at the rail ramp um, and they can't find it, it's adding to the transaction costs. The independent um, equipment providers um, 
are, are in a bit of a quandary because they've developed this model for the Southern California market, given its size, but they haven't been able to use it anywhere else in the country where they manage chassis, right? Um, and, and because it's a pool of pools and not fully interchangeable, lots of transaction costs and inefficiencies. Three sets of operating guidelines, right? Um, they've set up a third party, independent third party, to manage it and to manage the, 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 um, the exchange of finances virtually. Um, but you still have them operating their own company and then a subsidiary that's part of the pool of pools. But they actually see this as being necessary because of the, the way they operate in the rest of the country. Um, and they see the, their long-term sustainability as companies depending upon developing customer relations independent of the pool and pools. And they also see this trend toward longer-term leases with the truck drivers. Um, and they welcome the, uh, the port's involvement in making land available. Um, where do we want to go with this research? Um, we, we need to now take these scenarios and do what we did with, with some of the, the modeling of, of intraterminal operations and see what's actually, how much interterminal movement is occurring from one terminal to another. And from, of the chassis from the terminal and inland locations, right? Um, the real question is, and this is a, a much larger and longer term product, um, the, the bottom line is we'll know if, this, if, if the pool of pools or chassis pools in general have an impact as to whether it improves turn time for the truckers. And we don't have evidence of that just yet. Um, on a shorter term basis, we just had uh, the, the single largest uh, bankruptcy of an ocean carrier um, in Hanjin, which has created more havoc because it's taken more chassis out of the system because you've got a Hanjin container sitting on chassis that can't be moved because no one will move them until they have guaranteed payment. So in the short term, um, we've, got, we've got chaos out in our regional supply chains. And then the other big question is, is that because of those store door moves, the steamship lines haven't gotten out of the business, the ocean carriers haven't gotten out of the business of chassis ownership altogether. So there's some really, I think, interesting questions to be asked about who owns, who operates, and who gets billed for the chassis move after the pool of pools, because I think that will tell us a lot about um, the flexibility that the, the truck drivers have to dictate the terms of, of the chassis movements. So, more than you ever wanted to know about chassis. <laughs> um, but it's a pretty critical, it, they're pretty critical questions. Uh, questions, yeah. Um, in a transportation class with uh, Giuliano, actually, um, we talked about the uh, Southern California International Gateway uh -huh. Intermodal Freight Transfer Center that, despite its delays, is being considered for, uh, for the ports of LA and Long Beach. And I know, I know overall it relies on more of like a structural management operations mm -hmm. uh, fix, but you said that Southern California has a particularly unique situation. Do you think that if that uh, facility is developed, that would help with the management issues at all? Yeah, it, I, I see it having a potentially uh, tremendous benefit because ideally what you're doing is eliminating some of the more complex drays that would otherwise go to Rialto, to Norco, to San Bernardino. If you can keep those moves closer to the port, you make your, your supply chain a, a little bit less complex and more predictable. So to the extent that you can have an intermodal facility like SCIG near the port, it should facilitate some of the interoperability of the chassis as well. Part of the problem why Southern California is unique is the distance over which our drays occur. A, a, a dray essentially is anything that can be done within a 500 mile radius, which is the, the economic, the point at which rail becomes a little bit more cost effective. So you've got drays that go to Phoenix, drays that go to Vegas, right? That, that makes for a much more challenging supply chain and a much more difficult equipment management. Process. So I think the answer is yes. Yes, good. In the, uh, the aftermath of the Hanjin bankruptcy, is there an opportunity to capture all of the JCs formerly owned by Hanjin and contribute them to a new fleet, a new pool, or existing pool? The, the problem is not, is not that, because most of the Hanjin chassis have already been divested. 
and they're in the system. They've either been picked up by the independent operators, right? Um, the problem in the short term is that they're that Hanjin containers are resting on those chassis. So it's just, it's just sort of an, another shorter term problem that needs to work itself out. If that were the case, it would be a much more longer term structural problem. But my, I suspect that, that once the issue of the payment gets resolved, those chassis will get back into operation through the, through the IEPs. Is you mentioned the difficulties in tracking the chassis, or do they have RFID tags, or is it just all done? Like, how do they? Uh, um, optical character recognition, for the most part, so when they go through the the in gate, right? That's how you read the container. That's how you read the chassis. That's how you know if 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 when you get to the port, if you've got the right container on the right chassis, which is another potential stop in this. If if you don't, you got to go to a trouble window on the docks, and that adds another stop in time.